Hi, Mima. Hi, April. Do you know one of the four tales of wind, stars, sea, and homecoming? I had to learn the tale of homecoming. It took a long time, but I think I got it now. I'm better with pottery than I am with the tales, unfortunately. Do you want to hear it? Please. Very well. This is the tale of homecoming, my tale, and I shall tell it in my own words, as told to me by my teacher, in her words, and by her teacher in turn. Moran was a handsome young Alation man with strong wings and a hearty beak. He lived below the white cliffs, where the water was salty and the fish plentiful. Moran was betrothed to Anara, the loveliest girl there ever was. She was fair and slender and tall, and her eyes were the clearest shade of blue. But Moran was hesitant to enter into union with Anara, to become her husband and to give her children. He would always come up with a new excuse for why they had to wait a little while longer. Now, Anara was skilled at pottery, but even more so with stories, and the teller of the village had many times asked Anara to be her apprentice, to learn all the tales, so that someday she could take over as the teller. But Anara refused, knowing that if she did accept the teller's offer, she would never be able to marry Moran, because a teller cannot have a husband nor children of her own. Her refusal to become the teller's apprentice was unheard of, because who could refuse such an honor? But to Anara, love was more important. Her love for Moran was beyond honor, beyond reason. But despite Anara's love, Moran was still hesitant. And then one day he told Anara, I am traveling on a pilgrimage to the far shores. I will be gone for some time. And while I am traveling, and in accordance with our traditions, I will be freed from our betrothal. Not until I come back will the bond between us be renewed. It was not unusual for a young Alation man at that time to go on a pilgrimage, and the bond between the betrothed would often be cut while he was away, to be formed again upon his return. But Anara was heartbroken, because she had thought that Moran would soon want to marry her. When Moran saw her tears, he said to her, Do not weep. When I come back, I promise I will marry you. Just wait for me, and stay with your pots, to make the time pass quickly. And then Moran left on his pilgrimage to the far shores. Many years went by, and Moran had exciting adventures on the far shores. But by and by, he began to long for home, and for Anara. And now he had finally realized that he loved her, and that he wanted to marry her. But when he returned, he could not find Anara amongst the pot makers. He went to visit her family, and they told him that, after waiting for many years, Anara accepted the teller's offer of apprenticeship. And that when the teller left on the last wind during the previous winter, Anara herself became the new teller. Angry, Moran made his way to the teller's nest, and when he saw Anara, he said to her, You promised me you would wait! But Anara did not say a single word in answer. She just turned around and lifted something wrapped in leaves from the cot behind her and gave it to Moran. Moran unwrapped the package, and inside he found an old pot, cracked and broken in two. What is this pot? he asked. And why did you not wait for me like I asked you to? And finally Anara spoke, and she said to Moran, I made this pot for you, my dear Moran, when you left, because I wanted it to be my marriage gift to you, but when many, many years passed, I finally realized that you did not love me the way I loved you, and to live hoping otherwise would be death. But I want to marry you, cried Moran. I came back. But Anara just nodded at the broken pot in Moran's hands and said, like an old pot that is left without care, a heart may break in two, and a broken heart can never be mended. And so Anara turned away, never to speak with Moran again. And Moran's heart, like the pot that was left untended, broke in two, because absence makes a heart brittle. This was the tale of homecoming, my tale, and I told it in my own words as told to me by my teacher, and as I will tell it to my student when the time comes. Bye, Nima. Goodbye, April.
Hi, Saina. Hi, April. Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? Yes, my mommy taught me the tale of the stars. It's a really pretty story. Do you want me to tell it? Please, Saina, I would like that very much. Okay. This is my tale, the tale of stars, and I tell it to you in my own words, as it was told to me by my teacher in her words. In the small village of Jinjay near the rumbling hills of Onion, there lived a girl called Mona. She was a curious girl, and she would always get in the way of grown elation. Go play somewhere else, they would say to Mona, but she didn't want to play with the other children. She wanted to be where the grown-ups were, to see what they were doing, and learn from them. But one day, after getting many complaints from the pottery makers, and guardsmen, and traders, and soldiers in the village, Mona's mother told her that she wasn't to interfere with the grown-ups anymore. And that instead, she could go play with the other children, or sit still and draw, or work with clay. But Mona was always curious, and now, since she wasn't to be among the grown elation anymore, she decided to go exploring the forest that lay just outside of the village of Jinjay. She had many times been forbidden to enter the forest because it could be a dangerous place, but Mona was very curious. Of course she wasn't planning on going far into the forest, but then her eye caught sight of a white fluff tail hopping through the tall grass, and Mona, curious as ever, gave chase. The fluff tail ran away into the forest, and Mona followed, flying to where she was going, and interested only in catching the white fluff tail so that she could keep it as a pet. But then, after a good while, the fluff tail disappeared into a hole in the ground, leaving Mona alone in a small clearing, somewhere deep inside the forest. She was exhausted after running after the fluff tail for so long, and as she looked around at the clearing at the unfamiliar trees and flowers, she realized that she hadn't been paying attention to where she was going. Not for the first time, her curiosity had gotten the better of her, but this time it was serious. Mona was too young to fly, and she had very little sense of direction, and chasing the white fluff tail had made her dizzy and tired. It was getting darker, and Mona was all alone in the deep, dangerous forest, too sleepy and too scared to be able to go anywhere. Mona curled up with her wings wrapped around her under the leaves of a tree and began crying. Soon it got really dark, and somewhere, not far away, wolves started howling at the moon. Mona was so scared, she was petrified, but after a while her exhaustion got the better of her, and she fell asleep. She woke up when she heard a voice calling her from somewhere far above. Looking up at the starry sky, Mona saw a vision of the spirits of five tellers gazing down at her. You have let your curiosity leave you astray, said one. You are lost, and you deserve to be lost, said another. Poor little girl, said a third. We will help you home, said a fourth. But remember this, said the fifth spirit. We will lead you back to your village and to your mother only if you promise us one thing. I promise, said Mona. Whatever it is, I promise I will do it. Very well, said the first spirit. You will make the story of this night into your own tale, and you will call it the Tale of Stars. It will be a tale to warn the curious to be careful, continued the third spirit, and to not let their curiosity get the better of them. And, said the second spirit, to remind the elation that the spirits of their tellers watch out for them when they most need it. And so the spirits of the five tellers guided Mona through the forest, and by dawn she was home. And Mona did tell her tale, the tale of stars, to everyone in the village, so that everyone would remember that the curious must be cautious, and that the spirits of the tellers are always watching. This was my tale, the tale of stars, and I told it in my own words as my teacher did to me. That was a beautiful tale, Saina. Thank you. Bye-bye, Saina. You're leaving again? I wish you could stay.
Me too, Sayana, believe me. Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? Mine is the tale of sea, human. Would you mind telling it to me? I would be happy to do so. This is the tale of sea, told in my own words, as it was told to me by my teacher in his words, and to him by his teacher in his words. This was a very, very long time ago, when the Alation were a strong people, and we could spend days riding the hot winds above the seas. We hunted fish then, and we were at war with the Merum, the Wet Tails. Akalas was one of the strongest warriors there was. His claws were sharp and long, his beak pointy, and his teeth strong. Akalis was admired by everyone in his clan, and because of this he was cocky and arrogant. So one day the teller of Akalis city asked him to perform a very important and very special duty, to bring a sacred jewel to the teller of an elation town across the sea. This particular jewel was very important because it signified a union between the two towns, and it would benefit the people of both that it was delivered safely and promptly. Akalis grinned and told the teller that he would deliver the jewel both quickly and safely, and that she was not to worry. But the teller did worry because Akalis was young, and too sure of himself. But she wanted to test him, and to teach him that sharp claws, a pointy beak, and strong teeth are not all a warrior needs, that a warrior must also be wise and careful. So Akala set out across the sea on his flight. It was on the fourth day that he spotted something in the water that caught his attention, and forgetting his duty and following his curiosity, Akalis dived towards the water to investigate. When he came closer, he saw that there were Merum in the water, foolishly hunting close to the surface, and Akalis saw an opportunity to again prove his might. As a great warrior to his people, and to capture the fins of a few wet tails, but this time, Akala's arrogance got the better of him, because the Merum had set a trap. As he dived towards the Merum with his claws, a spear shot up from the water to hit him. Akala's struck the water and dropped the jewel he was carrying, and it was all he could do not to drown. Akala's was bleeding, and the Merum were grabbing onto his wings and his legs, but he fought bravely and finally he managed to escape. But even though he now lived, he was dead inside, because the shame of losing the sacred jewel would always be with him. Akalas could not return to his village, because he had neglected his duty to his teller and to his people, and so he went away to a small island where he could be alone. To himself and his people, Akalis now became the Lost One, he who had been on a sacred mission but had failed in his arrogance. A year passed, and one day Akalis met with human traders from a ship that came close to his island. From the traders Akalis heard speak of a hideous creature that lived in the sea, the Octowo. The Octowo was said to have a third eye, like a jewel, and that this eye pulled hapless sailors into its deadly eight-armed grasp. Akalis knew immediately that the Octowo's third eye had to be the jewel that he lost in the sea a year ago, 
and he now saw the opportunity to redeem himself. But Elation were not used to water, and the thought of submerging himself in the cold, harsh ocean chilled Achilles to his heart. But he was the lost one, and if in his death he could at the very least redeem himself, to his own heart, then, it would be worth it. So Achilles fashioned himself a spear, because in the water his claws and his beak would be too slow, and he flew out to where the octavo was last seen. And then Achilles dived into the sea. The dark water closed in on him, and his wings and legs went numb. But still Achilles kept pushing down until he saw the lair of the octavo. Spotting Achilles, the octavo attacked, and Achilles saw the monster's third eye, his sacred jewel, shining bright in the darkness, and his heart was filled with a sense of duty and courage that he had never felt before. But as he began fighting the eight-armed monster, Achilles realized that if he were to fight like he usually did, he would not stand a chance. He would have to think differently. And so Achilles tricked the octavo into following him through a tight chasm where the monster got stuck. And then he swam above it and, using his spear, tipped a rock on top of the octavo. Swimming back down again, the octavo was flailing helplessly. Now, almost out of air, Achilles took the sacred jewel from the octavo's head and swam back up. Finally, Achilles could deliver the sacred jewel to the town across the sea, and upon returning to his village, he went to the teller, bowed his head, and said, Forgive me, teller, for in my arrogance I thought I could do everything, but I could not and I became the lost one because of it. You were lost, said the teller, but you are no more, because now you see the limits of your own strength, and you will know that a warrior must be careful and wise in addition to being strong and fierce. This was the tale of sea, and I told it in my own words as told to me by my teacher. Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? Mine is the tale of winds, Windbringer. Do you wish to hear it? Very much. Then I shall tell it. This is the tale of winds, my tale, and I pledge to tell it in my own words, as told in turn by my teacher. In the village of Karan, in the mountains of tall winds, there lived a young Alation woman named Iwana. Iwana had one desire above all others, to soar higher and farther than anyone else. And even though her wings were no broader, nor her body sleeker than anyone else's, she pursued this foolish desire without rest. And as time passed, she did soar higher, and she did fly farther than the other young Alation in her village and her name became known far and wide amongst the tribes of the mountains of tall winds. But still, Iwana was not happy. She was not happy because, in her vanity, even though she was a better flyer than almost everyone else, and to her eyes, she was still not good enough. She wanted to be so much better than anyone else that she would be remembered for all time as the best flyer amongst all the Alation. And so one day, Iwana decided to climb to the top of Mount Bakta'ana, the Tower of Light, and to soar from those giddy heights to the ends of the world. Her friends and her family pleaded with her not to, because every Alation knew that to soar from such heights was dangerous, that at such heights the air was thin and the winds treacherous. But Iwana would not listen, 
And on a cold and clear morning, she climbed up the Tower of Light to the rock and the ice at the very top. From there, she could see to the ends of the world. And it brought tears to her eyes to know that now, finally, she would be greater and better than any elation before her. And so Iwana spread her wings and leaped off the mountain. Those who watched her from far below said that for a split moment Iwana soared, and she soared higher and farther than any elation before or since. But then the treacherous winds caught a hold of her, and the thin air made her plummet towards the ground and to fall to her death amongst the rocks at the base of the mountain. In her vanity, Iwana could not see beyond her desire to be the very best. And vanity always stands to fall. That was the tale of winds, my tale, and I told it in my own words, as told to me in turn by my teacher. Halt! Who would visit the teller? Are you ready for the questions now? Yes, ask me the questions. In the Tale of Winds, which mountain did Iwana fall from in her vain attempt to fly higher and further than anyone else? Mount Brokta'ana, the Tower of Light. That is correct. In the Tale of Stars, what did Mona see in the sky that helped her find her way home? The spirits of five tellers. That is correct. In the Tale of Sea, what creature did the Lost One battle in his quest to recover the sacred jewel? The Octavo? That is correct. My final question to you is this. In the tale of homecoming, what was given to Moran by his teller when he returned from his pilgrimage? A broken pot to teach him that absence may break a heart in two. You have correctly answered all my questions and so have proven your knowledge of the four tales. You are the windbringer. The teller would see you presently. She's the teller. She must be over a hundred years old. Come closer, human. Closer. I cannot see your face. Closer still. Come sit here by me. There you are. <laughs> you see, my eyes are not what they used to be. Ages ago, I could spot a ladybug crawling up a straw of grass from 15 tree lengths up. Now, I have a hard time seeing my supper. But my ears, balance be praised, my ears, they are as good as ever. I could hear you outside, learning the tales my children tell. You are a good listener and a fast learner. They were interesting stories, and your people told them well. That is what we do. The Elation are the keepers of the tales, and I am their teller, the one who must know all the tales told since the day we came to this world. How can you do that? How can you remember every story ever told? The secret is to tell them often and to tell them in your own words, not the words of your ancestors. Doesn't that mean that the stories change with every generation? Yes, as all tales must. Change is important. Otherwise, the tales will have no meaning to us. They will just be words. And we do not care about the words. We care about what the words tell us. 
How long have your people been telling stories? Since the beginning, human. Since we came to this world a long, long time ago. You're not from Earth? From Arcadia? Not according to our tales. We came on a great wind before the Divide, when the Earth was one and humans had yet to learn of magic and science. But we were a different people then, and the tales we tell from that time are vague and incomplete. Like myths and legends, the younger relation pay little attention to these tales. Sometimes I worry they will be lost with me, these tales, and I am getting old, very old. I came to you to find answers to some important questions. Ask, and I will try my best to answer. Have you heard of an ancient god or dragon that lives beneath the sea? Once, long ago, when my people lived in harmony with the Merim, there were stories of an old god worshipped by the Merim who resided deep in the darkest depths of the ocean. According to legend, the old god had once brought the Merim into their realm, into the ocean, and he was now sleeping, resting, before the journey back. Back where? To a great ocean amongst the stars. When the time came, he would gather the Merim and bring them home with him, back to their world, to their ocean. Strangely enough, we have a similar tale. It is said that the great wind that brought us here will someday return to bring us back to a place where we can soar forever on warm winds. Like heaven. In a way, perhaps, but without the need for any of us to die. The great wind will just sweep us up and carry us away. Every evening before I go to sleep, I recite this tale to myself. It is a comforting one. What do you know about the dry kin? Kin are numbered four, or so our tales tell. Two in this world, two in the other. The mirror world, the white and the blue, the red and the green. Do you know where they are? No, the tales never say. The kin are elusive. They keep to themselves. I have never seen one myself, and I doubt any of my kind has. The tales do say that our past and our future are tied to the fate of the kin, but how I would not pretend to know. This is one tale that is yet to be told. Do you know anything about the Guardian's realm? This is human business. Would you not know more than I? Your people are the keepers of the tales. You remember more than humankind is forgotten. Please, I need to hear what you know. That is very little. The Guardian's realm is home to the Guardian in his tower. No one is permitted within except the Guardian who was, the Guardian who is, and the Guardian who will be. And of course, the Dryak kin, who were instrumental in its making. Have you ever heard of the existence of a hidden entrance to his realm? Oh, yes. Yes, I have heard tell of such a thing, though I would not know where it is. I gather that one of the kin may be able to tell you. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. I am glad I could help you with some answers. I'm the Windbringer. I know you are. <laughs> it's strange to me to hear those words spoken. I did not think they would be in my lifetime. But here you are, standing in front of me as real as the sky is blue. I'm sorry I have to ask, but what is it that the Windbringer is supposed to do for you? I did not expect you to walk in here and have all the answers, child. The balance has both blessed you and cursed you and it has sent you here to do what it wills. The Windbringer is said to be the first sign of the great wind that will take us away from here. For a long time, the Elation have lost the strength they used to have. Our bones have become weak and our wings fragile. Where we used to be able to soar for days on strong winds, we are now using our legs to walk rather than fly. Why this is, we do not know. Tanyen! 
You know of the reason for this? I'm just guessing, but it makes sense. Go on. The tales also say that the Windbringer will unite us with our past and end the age-old strife. I know. You must make peace and be reunited with the Marum. You share a common ancestry. I have always thought we did. The tales were too similar, the signs clear. But my people, they... They will have a difficult time understanding why and how this can be. If you don't, both the Elation and the Marum will die out. When war broke out between your people and you were forced to move up into the mountains, it compromised a precarious symbiosis. A substance called Tanyan was abundant where the Marum and the Elation lived in close proximity. It brought fish and heat and light to both your people. But now, Living up in the mountains, your way of life, your diet, your customs and habits, they've all changed. And that's probably the cause of your brittle bones and fragile wings. Then we must make peace with the Marum and restore the balance between us, so as to strengthen us both and prepare us for the journey that will surely come soon. When our sitting is over, I will speak to my people, and I will elect one representative from the Elation to meet with the Marum in the place of your choosing to open a dialogue. I guess it's time for you to talk to your people and for me to make arrangements with the Marum. Where do you wish for our meeting to take place, Windbringer? You want me to decide? Um, well, I know. Send your ambassador down to the ancient caves by the beach. Inside, there are remnants of an old Alation settlement and a Marum city. It's a good place for your two people to meet, don't you think? Yes. And could you ask if they would bring their half of the stone? The stone? You have the other half? We have held on to it for centuries, knowing that someday it would be of use to the Windbringer. It will, trust me. Then we must make haste and arrangements. It is an important day, so let us not waste light. Go and wait for my ambassador in the caves.